So everyone settled. Today we're going to talk about in the next half hour about AI, uh, or in German, Künstliche Intelligenz. And um, as a designer, what's interesting for me is AI has become a little bit like, I'm going to date myself here, um, Kai's Power Tools. Does anyone remember Kai's Power Tools from Photoshop? It kind of feels like it's the Kai's Power Tools of today. So let's just get into it first. Um, Lars, maybe introduce yourself. How did you get to Adobe, and, and what are you doing there now? Yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long story and a short story. The short story is um, I got hired by them about two years ago. The long story is um, I'm a rehire, actually, a boomerang. Um, so I've been with Adobe and, and, and with the folks at Adobe for about 10 years. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of history. And there's a lot of love, I guess, right? Oh, a absolutely. Um, so um, the, a, 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 a company that has invented a term for people who come back because they've realized that the grass is not always greener on the other side. Right. Um, I think that's a, that, that speak for, speaks for itself. Okay. So when we think about AI, we typically do not, I personally do not think about Adobe at all. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. when you think about AI, you think uh, the, the players, of course, being Google and um, Google, and then maybe, maybe Facebook a little bit, mostly Google. Yeah. What is Adobe doing in AI? So um, when we look at AI, right, we look at AI only from the perspective of digital experiences. Right? We have no interest in creating self-driving cars, killer robots, or things like that. Right? But we aim to have um, AI that creates killer digital experiences. Right? So this includes, um, on the one hand, a focus on what we call computational creativity. Right? So helping the, helping the creative um, express themselves more quickly, more easily, and faster, and really c cope with the demands of the creative workplace, right? where you have to create more, more, more in shorter and shorter time. Um, on the other hand, it's about what we call um, um, cognitive content. Right? So um, a lot of our business is about digital documents. And, um, and when you look at digital documents so far, they are basically just, it's basically digital ink, right? You, you spill digital ink on digital paper, and there's not a lot of understanding. So um, this is something that we're investing in very heavily to make sure that uh, a PDF that really is just a representation of what you would print to become a true um, representation of the document and the meaning, right? Which can also help with very simple things like making it more accessible and making it more readable on a mobile device. Right? Every, every, everyone knows this experience of opening a PDF on, um, on, a, on a small mobile screen and then having to pinch and zoom and scroll. And um, by having a better understanding, we can help with that. Right. The last part of this is what we call enlightened experiences. Right? So this is um, really about having um, the ability to create digital experiences for marketing for entertainment, for education, that are not just cool, but that are effective, right? That get the point across, that help you, in the, in the end, convert and to purchase. And this is only possible by having an understanding of content on the one hand, and on the other hand, of data, right? And understanding how people are interacting with these experiences. Okay, cool. So I think a, a big topic with um, automation and AI is also this idea of how many, how many of us are gonna be working in the future. Um, and you said it's helping the creatives kind of do their job a little better. Do you think mm -hmm. at some point they'll, it'll do their jobs better than the creatives? I think there will be parts that a computer is much, much better at doing than a human, right? And, and that, that stretches to every part of, of our life, right? Including, including creativity. Does that mean that creativity as a whole be, will become computerized? No way, right? Um, and one of the reasons for this is that um, AI in particular is very good in um, situations that are repeatable. Right? So um, when, um, when it comes to, let's say, um, removing the background of the 100s or 100,000th photo, right, this is something that is such a mind-numbingly boring task that you would love to have an AI on it. Right. Um, on the other hand, coming up with a completely new design, coming up with a completely new way at, to look at things, this is really something that you can't train an AI, AI for. Right. What, what you might be able to do is you might be able to build something that just tries a number of random combinations, um, evaluates them against a couple of rules of thumb of creativity, and then gives you the ability to propose and to pick. 
um, but it will never completely replace the, the human being in, in creativity. And one of the reasons is that the end consumer is still a human being. Right? It's not that we have robots creating digital experiences for other robots. Yeah. It's humans for yeah. humans. That's interesting. Because I, th I think of, when I think of how we measure things online, like through views, clicks, and stuff, there are, you can buy clicks and you can, you can have machines consume what other machines do. Right. So I think... And, and one, one, of the, one of the reasons, right, when you are measuring clicks, when you're measuring Facebook likes, when you're measuring, do Google Pluses still exist? <laughs> right? So um, then you're measuring the thing that is easy to measure, right. but not the thing that matters. Right? The thing that matters is not if a customer clicked on your website. The thing that matters is not even if the customer bought the product. But the thing that matters is the customer using the product, is the customer successful, and is the customer going to continue to buy. And that is much, much harder to measure. Right? And this is, again, why you want to have technology that helps you, not just technology that helps you do the easy things. Right. So I do some, I play around a little bit in, uh, with video, so in Premiere. And I, on our previous call, you mentioned there's, a, there's something that makes it a little bit easier yeah. to edit in video. What was that, what was that thing called? So um, we, have, we have two things in, in Premiere. One is called Time Tuner. The idea is um, you, have, you have video footage, right? And, um, and your client tells you, this footage is really great. Could you please take eight seconds off? Um, right? And suddenly you think, okay, where are the where are this eight seconds that I can take off? And um, with Time Tuner, um, Premiere basically analyzes the entire video and finds the most boring frames, right? And essentially removes the most boring frames from the from the video. And it finds um, it finds specific cut patterns where you can cut off just a little bit more, right? So across your entire, let's say, um, 100, 130 second video, it will find lots of lots of mini slices to take away and and recut it into a smaller package, right? Um, something that would have taken you hours before and would probably have led to a subpar experience is now really, really fast. Right. An another example is um, when it comes to, when you have the same problem with music, right? So um, you, you, you have a great background song that you want to use for, for a clip. But that background song, well, most songs are longer than, than one and a half minutes. So how do you, how do you cut it, right? And, one way of doing this is to just speed it up, right? In which case it would just sound like yakety sax. Um, another way is to fade it out or fade it in, which again is really compromising the integrity of the song. So um, with the feature called Remix, um, what we do is we identify um, the different parts of the song. We identify the beginning, the end, and the middle. And we identify repeating patterns that we can take, take out. So um, that way we can, we can cut and basically remix the song so that it matches the length of the footage. Right. What's, so what's interesting for me then is, do you think in the future that there will be no more boring videos then? If, if, if the machines are saying, OK, all the boring <laughs> stuff is gone, how do, how do you measure what's how do you measure what's boring for a machine versus what's boring for a human? And then all of us have been to those movies where they've been so boring, you just wonder yeah. what's happening. But there's something that, that well, adds I, to it. I, I think, I think the, the human potential for boredom is unlimited. So, and um, and um, one, one, of the, one of the things that is happening, right? When, when, I, when I think of films that are just too long, I just think of Peter Jackson, right? And why does that happen? That happens because you give full creative control to one director who is making decisions without any constraints. Right? And, and, I, and I truly believe that constraints enhance and help with creativity. Definitely. Right? So um, you, can, you can use an AI basically as, um, as almost like a, um, like a digital art director. Right, that is imposing constraints and is telling you things like, hey, you know what, a movie really shouldn't be longer than two hours because nobody can sit that long. Right. So let's, let's shift a little bit to why you went back to Adobe and what the culture of Adobe and how, how that plays into this whole idea of innovation because that's what David mm -hmm. was talking about before. So what, number one, wh where were you before you, after you left? Adobe, and why did you go back to Adobe? Yeah, so um, I went to a German company called Blue Yonder, um, which does um, machine learning for retail. 
And um, before the, the first time I joined Adobe was through the acquisition of Day Software. And at Day Software, we built essentially web content management systems, something that is now um, part of Adobe Experience Manager. Mm. And, and um, Adobe has a very long history of acquisitions and mm -hmm. growing through acquisitions. Right? Um, we, we use the, the slightly creepy term of um, injecting new DNA into the company, right? Um, and, 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 and that's really true, right? It's not just that we acquire companies in order to shut them down, but we acquire companies and try to make them really a core part of Adobe. And um, the, the older ones of you remember that we acquired um, Macromedia a long time ago, right? Um, but for a lot of people, um, there isn't that much of a difference between the former Macromedia products and the former Adobe products. And, um, and, and that is really what we are aiming for, right? To integrate products and to also integrate people and to integrate new ideas. So I remember, uh, I remember I worked with Macromedia, Flash, what was it? it was, and GoLive was also an Adobe project, right? Go, actually, GoLive is a product that was developed here in Hamburg. That's so right, yeah, um, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 for, the former GoLive team is now working on things like Shared Cloud, which is the underlying content services yeah. for um, Creative Cloud. So it's, okay. it's really a remarkable transition, right? right. You, you had a product that was to a degree competitive to another Adobe product or to another, I think it was a Macromedia pro you, you know what, I don't know the history myself that well, right? But an, another product, um, but we kept the people on board and because the people had great experience and, um, and the people had great knowledge that we could use, right? And, and, that, is, and that is really what I, what I like about um, Adobe. Yeah. So when, when I started the agency in, in 1996, I, I had a, one of my partners was David and he was, so I was more, I guess I was more like the geek, so I would code stuff. And he, he was a big fan of, uh, of GoLive and this WYSIWYG software, right. right? Do you think AI, if we bring it back to AI, do you think AI is more like the WYSIWYG of, of the next generation? Do you guys know WYSIWYG? What you see is what you get kind of easy. It's instead of having to go through the, the code, you just have like, you just move stuff around, it's easier. It's an, it's an, it's an interesting question. I think, I think you, you could make that argument, right? Yeah. Um, because it, it you, in, in, the, in, the, in the 90s, right, we had this discussion about VisiVig was this essentially handcrafted code, right? And I, I was somebody who would definitely handcraft code and take a lot of pride in the way I indented my HTML right. and all, all, these, all these stupid things. So um, with AI, you can get to results very, very quick. Right. But um, at, at the same time, as humans, we don't just value the result, but we also value the ingredients. Right? This, is why we, this is why we buy um, or pay five bucks extra for artisanal coffee. Right? Not, not because it tastes differently, but because we believe the story. And I think the same, the same will be true in a lot of cases, right? where we will yeah. have products that are differentiated by using AI and products that are differentiated by not using AI in a place where using AI would be obvious. Right. So another, another topic that I find interesting, since I'm American, but I live in Germany, I think this whole idea of innovation is an optimism. It's something I, when I go back to the US every, every year, because we have great vacation here in, in Europe, so you go back for four weeks or whatever, and I do feel that the people are more optimists. And here in Hamburg, I know you're, you live in Berlin, here in Hamburg, uh, someone once told me people are like coconuts, the Germans, because they're hard on the outside, but when you get inside, they're soft. So, whereas in the US, everybody's kind of just soft and you don't know. <laughs> um, what, the point there is, when you go, you travel a lot for your job, right? You were just in uh, the Valley, Silicon Valley, and um, you come back here and then you go back home to Berlin. What do you find, I mean, what are like the overarching sentiments with where, th where things are headed? And especially in terms of AI, I mean, there's, we have a lot of really um, influential people talking about the, the destruction of mankind through AI, whether it's Stephen Hawking or Elon Musk or whatever. What do you find yeah. the, the differences culturally in, in Europe or in, in uh, Germany versus the US yeah. versus wherever you might yeah. be in the world? The, the thing that I find interesting about this discussion about AI is going to end humanity is that most of this discussion is led not by AI practitioners, right, but by people who have expertise in, in other fields. Right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
tell Stephen Hawking about the dangers of the Large Hadron Collider creating a different timeline where Donald Trump is being elected president, right? And, um, and on, on the other hand, on the other hand, um, for people who are working with AI on a daily basis, but we just know it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard work. It takes a lot of data, and we simply don't have enough data to destroy humanity yet. So, yes, um, <laughs> you, you heard it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I think, I think an, another, another part that is, um, of, of the discussion that is different right, is that in, in Europe, and especially in Germany, um, the the discussion of the impact of AI and um, of algorithms is um, is much more rooted in reality. Right? So the things like killer robots are going to take over the earth, that's not going to happen. But, um, but um, unethical algorithms are going to negatively affect our lives and our societies. That's a real threat, right? And that's a real danger. And, and I think that is, that is something that, as technologists, we have, to be, we have to be aware of and we have to be cognizant of. And um, I, I really like um, there's um, Melvin and Kranzberger's first law of technology, which says technology is neither good nor evil, nor is it neutral. Right? It is not neutral. And, we, and we, have to, we have to see how our technology is being used and what impact it has on, on, on the people who are using it, but more importantly on the people who are not using it. Right. I have, um, it's interesting because I have, I have two kids and I also think about if, if anyone has kids, you think about what the future they're going to be in. And unless you really talk to your kids, I think a lot of people are kind of oblivious to, to right. what they think. And, and at, through our conversation, I know you have a family as well. Do you think AI will ever be so well-tuned that, that kids don't have to go to school? That they can just learn through uh, Socratic uh, discussion with the AI? In, 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 interesting, right? And, and you, could, you, could make, you could make the argument that we are right now at a place where you don't have to go to school to learn, right? And, and, and when, you, when you look at all the resources that are available on the internet, and when you look at the way our curriculum is structured in school, you could, you could argue, just like the office is not the best place to get work done, the school is probably not the best place to learn something. However, it will take a while to adjust, right? And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm working from home a lot, right? And it, it's, it's definitely a change from working in, in, in an office. And so is self-directed learning or A-directed learning um, a difference from teacher-directed learning as it's happening today. Right. So we have three minutes left. Maybe we just talk about some of the, the narratives that have formed through um, the narratives that form our realities. What I'm talking about is basically, if we think about AI, all of these scenarios are basically, they're done through films and, and books right. and, and stories, right? And that's how we as, as humans relate to each other and yep. understand our worlds. But as of yet, most of the stories, with the exception of maybe like uh, Star Wars or Star Trek, but most of the stories like Blade Runner, like even Her, if some of you have seen Spike Jones as Her, they've always been somewhat, um, somewhat on the yeah. negative versus with yeah. AI. What kind of, what kind of, are you interested in, in that, those kind of scenarios or what kind of things influence you most? Okay, I really love the science fiction stories. They're fiction, right? They have nothing to do with my life and my work. But um, I, can off, I can offer you an alternative narrative to um, explaining what AI is, right? Um, and um, there's, a, there's a university in Finland that built a new campus. And um, in the middle of the campus, they had a big lawn. And they had the question, OK, how do we pave paths across the lawn, right? Do we just do it di diagonally or orthogonally? And you know what they did? They just left the lawn in place for a, an entire year, right? And then they looked where the pathways um, that people trampled into the grass. And then they paved the pathways. AI. Um, and machine learning is a lot like this, right? It's about paving the pathways. It's following, it's following the herd to a certain degree um, and doing the things that a lot of people do, right? So it's a very, very easy way to visualize this, right? I imagine this is, this is what things are doing. This, these are the things that people are doing anyway. We just discover them, make it easier, pave the pathways, and, um, and turn it into algorithms. Right. Yeah. 
They call that in design desire paths. Right. So when you, the, like what you're talking about is when there's a sidewalk and then you see there's a dirt path because everyone exactly. decided not to take the, the concrete yeah. sidewalk. Does that mean though if, if AI just supports popular, popular sentiment that popular sentiment is just going to become more popular and the unpopular stuff will become less popular? What do you, you know, where, do you, where do you find the, the serendipity in, in machine learning and AI? Is, yeah. there, is there such? Well, so, so the, the, the funny thing about serendipity in AI is something that um, good designers of AI inject manually. Mm. Right? So they, they just inject a bit of random noise because random noise helps to train the system. Right? So it's, it's, it's a, a, a good AI designer is never going to say, well, this AI is final and it's the best thing ever. It knows that people's preferences are changing. Right? So you inject, in, inject a, ran, a bit of random noise. You send a couple of people off unpaved pathways to see if they can prove popular. Mm. Right? So there, 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 there is a chance for this. Obviously, there is also the chance of the filter bubble and, um, and just the popular getting more popular. So. Cool. Any last words? We're out of time. Um, do you have any last words you want to say about AI, the future AI? Where do you think we're going to be in 2020? That's in two years with AI. And I think 2020 is, to a large degree, looking very much like... Um, 2018? 2018. <laughs> okay. So it's... Um, it's I think Bill Gates said people typically overestimate what can be done in two years and underestimate what can be done in ten years. Right. right? So um, it's not going to be that much of a difference, right? But um, I think we are going to get to the point where we will simply stop talking about AI because it's because we also stop talking about the internet right. and we stop talking about electricity and we stop talking about daylight. Yeah, right? and hopefully we stop talking about digital as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lars.